in, in silence. Um, and, but that is the, that's the special moment to me. That, that's the moment that I always am looking for, is to go through that again. Because in that moment, when you have described the gospel to somebody and you now ask them to respond, you are watching the Holy Spirit at work right in front of you. You, know, you, you may not be able to see him with your physical eyes, that you can sense that there's a, there's a battle that's raging in the person's spirit, uh, and you just have to sort of back off and wait and see how that battle is, is going to, uh, is going to uh, come out. Uh, either they will say, yeah, I, I would. And then you get to lead them in, in the sinner's prayer. Or they will say something like, uh, I'm not ready to do that. Yes. Um, and then you have to be spirit-led to decide how much further do you want to press in. But you've at least made that point after they've had the opportunity to respond. So on this page, page two, you have Romans 10, 9. Uh, and I've tried to put this in sort of a graphic form that depicts how I think about this verse. Obviously, it's good to have these verses memorized, not part of memorized, Romans 3, 23, 6, 23, and 10, 9. But there are three key words in Romans 10, 9. You confess with your mouth Jesus the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. Saved, believe, and confess. And typically, what I'll do is uh, quote the verse and then explain it in reverse order. And that's what this little diagram down here is doing. Those words come in one order when you quote the verse, and then you can describe them in the opposite order. Uh, as, you, as you look at these sentences that give a description. I've written a sentence with each one that gives a description, but you can put it in your, in your own words. If you just remember those three key words, and you know that you have confidence in yourself, that you can tell somebody in a sentence or two, what does it mean to be saved? That you can tell somebody in a sentence or two, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? And you can explain to somebody, what does it mean to confess Jesus as Lord? You're ready to go. You have you just learned a canned presentation. And you haven't used it yet, maybe. Uh, I hope that you get the opportunity to do so. Uh, and that's why usually we have field time as well as, as classroom time for doing this. Uh, so that you can watch somebody else do it. So look, this page gives you a one verse presentation uh, of the gospel. All right, let's look at page uh, next, page three. And we're, we're going to look at the conversations that Jesus had in Book of John and see what we can learn about how to be flexible in describing the truth of the gospel to different people. Now, before we look at these conversations, let me hasten to mention that Jesus is not presenting the gospel presentation that you and I would think about. Because, one, what well, he is the gospel, and he has to die on the cross. There's, there's, there's no death or resurrection to talk about yet. Well, there is. He, he starts to predict it. Uh, but it's not, it's not an accomplished event yet. And so his conversations are a little bit different from ours. He talks about the kingdom, the spirit, things that, things that were important for people to know. But what we want to get out of this conversation is we just want to see how flexible he is in describing spiritual truth and then talk about how we can learn that same kind of flexibility and employ that in talking to other people uh, about spiritual truth. So let's just first of all read through the conversation. If you want to follow along in your Bible, it's in John chapter 3, the first 15 or so verses. I'll just read it out and follow along. There was a certain man from the Pharisees, Nicodemus was his name, a leader of the Jews. He came to him, Jesus at night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God, a teacher, uh, for no one is able to do the signs that you do uh, unless God were with you. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless someone is born again, they are not able to see the kingdom of God. He then he said to him, How is a man able to be born when he is old? He is not able to enter into his mother's womb a second time to be born. Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless someone is born from water and spirit, he is not able to enter the kingdom of God. The one who has been born from flesh is flesh, and what is born from spirit is spirit. Don't be amazed that I said to you it is necessary for you to be born again. The spirit blows wherever it wants, and you hear its sound, 
but you do not see from whence it comes or where it goes. In the same way it is for everyone born of the Spirit or from the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? You notice this conversation that Nicodemus is saying it's gets shorter and shorter, and Jesus is getting longer and longer. Uh, Nicodemus, how can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, You are the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Amen, amen, I say to you that what we know, we testify, what we have seen, what we know, we speak, what we have seen, we testify, and our testimony, you do not, you all, he switches to plural here, now this is all, not always clear in our English versions, because you, uh, in English, goes for both singular and plural, uh, except when you're in the South, we've got it figured out, y'all, but I haven't been able to get to put y'all in the Bible yet. <laughs> This is a y'all in verse 11. Amen, amen. I say, uh, first of all, to you, that was singular. Then that we, and this is interesting because that was plural, Jesus speaking for himself. We uh, speak uh, what we know and testify what we have seen. And here's the you all. You all do not receive our testimony. If I spoke to you about earthly things and you do not believe, how is it if I speak to you about heaven? Will you believe? And no one has come down, no one has gone up into heaven except for the one who came down, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, in the same way it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, so that everyone believing in him might have eternal life. And then John 3.16, which we all know really, really well, and our editors of the New Testament really struggled with knowing where to close the quotes here. Uh, it, some of them quote close them as early as verse 15, some after 16, some go all the way to 20 or 21. Uh, those weren't in the original text. It's really hard to tell. Uh, when, does, does John kind of start putting in some commentary here, or is this all the conversation that Jesus had with uh, with Nicodemus? All right, so let's get our books, look at page three, and talk about this conversation for just a moment. It says at the top of worksheet 2, look at the account of Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3, 1 to 21. I read through verse 15. And make a few notes on the following questions. Here's the first one. So, how did Jesus encounter Nicodemus? What's the answer to that question? Okay, that's a win. He was at the. Okay, but that's really the main thing we want to get out of this. That this is one of those unusual situations where the person comes to you. Nicodemus came to Jesus. But there's a reason for that. That wasn't just random. Why would Nicodemus be coming to Jesus in the first place? He's a teacher of the law. What's that? He's a teacher of the law. Yeah, he, Jesus had a reputation. Um, and if you are living a life in the world that has a reputation of being a believer, then there's a chance that people will come and ask you about Jesus. And so your life sets up the opportunity for you to share Jesus uh, with, with other people. Uh, I, years ago, I um, realized, um, I'll just be, bear myself here a little bit, years ago I realized, I was told, uh, when I got into, uh, sort of moved toward uh, full-time ministry in my mid to late 30s, uh, that one of the dangers about being full-time ministry is that you surround yourself with believers. And you spend so much time trying to minister to the needs of believers uh, that you look up one day and you realize, I don't know any other believers. Uh, and it gets hard to, to share the gospel. You have to really be intentional. You have to go out and, uh, because you just sort of become insulated uh, with believers around you. And, and I find that's happened to me Times. That's one of the reasons that I love our outreach semesters, because no matter what is going on, it forces me out into the community to knock on doors and reach, meet people and actually talk to unbelievers uh, about Jesus. But um, you don't have to be a pastor for that to happen to you. You can have the same thing happen to you, too. You can look up and realize that all your friends, all your acquaintances, everyone that you spend time with are believers. So who are you going to tell about Jesus? Well, you're going to have to make, uh, you're going to have to do something to build a bridge into the life of an unbeliever or, uh, or be that kind of person that will just tell somebody who's working behind the counter in Valero about Jesus. You know, those people are out there 
I've never been one of those. I've done it before, but I'm really uncomfortable with it. But I've been around people that are just so comfortable talking to anybody, anywhere, anytime about Jesus. It just blows my mind, you know. They sort of, I call that the gift of evangelism. Uh, the rest of us, not so much. You know, we're looking for those opportunities where we can tell people about Jesus. But we're, if we're living a life that is uh, openly uh, following Jesus, then there's, there's a chance that people will come and talk to us. So that makes it easier. Number two, how did Jesus turn the conversation to spiritual matters? How would you answer that question? What did he do? Yeah, Jesus just jumped right in with this being born again. Um, but he really, uh, it was kind of shocking, I think, to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was talking about, you know, he was kind of puffing Jesus up, getting ready for a good, good conversation. And Jesus just comes right back at him and says, you can't come to the kingdom unless you're born again. Boom. Um, and now, Jesus has one up on us. He, he knows what people are thinking. Uh, and we, we, uh, we admit that. But, I will say this, if you'll put yourself out there and tell other people about Jesus, the Holy Spirit will get involved in your life in ways that you've never experienced before. You know, this generation loves to sing great music and have emotional experiences in worship, and i got nothing against that. But if you want to taste a different uh, experience with the Holy Spirit, one that's incredibly powerful, go out and play the church on people about Jesus. Uh, uh, if you really do love experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life, then you'll go tell people about Jesus. Because once you've done it, uh, and it's hard not to do it again. Yes, sir? He took control of the conversation. Uh, you've ever been like a customer service where somebody comes in and says, This is an interesting question 
Uh, and it's one that I assumed I knew the answer to for many, many years. I assumed that Nicodemus was, uh, was, was just surprised by what Jesus was saying and didn't understand it. And that may be true, but I have since then uh, read that there are some people, some commentators, students of this text, believe that this picture of being born again was not that unusual in the first century. Uh, it was, it, they, they have found it uh, in other sources. And so Nicodemus may have heard it before. And so Nicodemus' response here may be a little more nuanced than we think. Nicodemus may be uh, sort of jiving with Jesus a little bit. You know, that there's no way to know. We would have to be in the room, see the looks on the faces, hear the, uh, the, their voice inflection, uh, to know whether or not one or the other is true. Uh, I just say that uh, to remind us that we do have to be in the room. We do have to be reading the other person and listening to them, looking at their body language, their facial expression, to uh, figure out how we bet can best respond to them. Yes, ma'am. Jesus kind of dresses him down about that. Maybe that's an indication of what you're talking about. If Jesus does dress him down, that might be an indication that uh, we should take it as him just not understanding. Uh, because Jesus says, you are the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things, Jordan. Well, he was questioning in verse 4 and verse 9, he was questioning why. Why does this happen? Because he, he's asked, how can someone be born again? Or reborn when they are old. And then he goes to verse 9. How can this be? If we take it at face time, then he just doesn't understand. Yes. Uh, but the, some students believe that Nicodemus wasn't quite as um, uh, obtuse as we have made him out to be. And maybe he was trying to spar with Jesus a little bit more than, than we realize. Either way, uh, he wasn't receiving Jesus. Message uh, and he was far uh, certain. So let's look at the second half of the page here. Consider the following points. Can you fill in the missing words? Nicodemus may have visited Jesus at night to avoid being seen with him since Jesus was such a controversial character. Jesus' days were long and busy. He got tired. He could have asked Nicodemus to come back later, but he didn't. Jesus took time to speak with Nicodemus even though it was after hours. Not exactly the most convenient time for him. Point number one, the best witnessing opportunities might be what? Inconvenient. Absolutely. Uh, and this is something where I have to really watch myself too. Because I get on a schedule, I've got things to get done, and I can blow by people sometimes and not, not catch the ministry opportunity. And I've always been impressed by Jesus. I think Jesus just stopped for anybody and everybody. You know, all that, that committee meeting away, no big deal. You know, he's he's gonna he's gonna deal with people. And really that's that's what our attitude should be because what matters most, people. Uh, and Jesus was highly interruptible. Uh, and I've I've tried to make that um, an aspect of my ministry. I'm highly interruptible. I really appreciate the fact that when some of you come in to uh, talk to me, you are so polite. I, I don't want to interrupt you. But the fact is, um, you have a right to and I need to be interrupted, or we need to be interrupted by the world when it comes to these kinds of spiritual issues. What could be more important than somebody's eternal soul? All right, second paragraph. As a leader among God's people, Nicodemus would never admit openly to insecurity about his standing before God. After all, he was an Israelite by birth. Nevertheless, something drew Nicodemus to Jesus. Jesus looked beyond Nicodemus' reputation and pedigree. He looked beyond Nicodemus' question about Jesus' credentials. Jesus turned the conversation to the subject of personal salvation using the picture of new birth. So, despite blame, everyone's greatest need is eternal life. Despite your station in life, I would take that. Status, I would take that. Reputation, I would take that. Earthly security, okay? Yet all of those answers are right, right on target. The word I used was appearances, despite appearances. 
we're saying the same thing. Some people just look like they've got it all together. You know, and you might think, oh, I don't need to tell them about Jesus. They look like they've got it together. They just look like a Christian. What's a Christian look like? Don't tell me that. Uh, but but it, is, it is easy to make those kinds of judgments, isn't it? Uh, it's also easy to make judgments on the other end of the, the scale. Uh, and I've been guilty of this, especially when I was doing street evangelism years ago. I saw some people that just looked so crazy that I thought, well, they're, you know, there's no reason to tell them about Jesus. They can't get saved. You know, and of course, God had to be. I think that was really, that was just me being afraid to talk to him and coming up with an excuse not to. Well, I don't need to talk to that guy. I mean, he's got two feet in hell already. Uh, so just let him slip away. But uh, we, we just can't tell what's going on in people's lives just by looking at us, uh, by looking at their appearances. Bottom of the page, last paragraph, Nicodemus resisted Jesus' presentation of spiritual truth. Jesus persisted with his gospel picture. But he proceeded to add a reference to the Bible. Jesus mentioned an episode from the Exodus that was recorded in Numbers 21, Moses of the Bronze Day. He did so without telling the entire story, knowing that Nicodemus would already be familiar with the incident because of his training and knowledge about Scripture. So what can we draw from this? We should use Bible passages in accordance with the listener's what? Bible knowledge, in accordance with the listener's Bible knowledge. Now, this is something that we have to measure as we go along if we're talking to a stranger. Uh, we have to be very careful that they're a stranger. They may appear to know more about the Bible than they really do. Uh, but if, if you're talking to a friend, if you're talking to somebody that you've known, uh, or a family member, then you may already have a measure of how well they know or don't know. And whether or not you can just throw out, oh, remember the prodigal son. Or do you need to tell a story of the prodigal son? Yes, ma'am. Just to say, you start telling it, and you see, you can, if you start telling it and ask a question about it, then you can actually learn where there are people on the line. Or if they really know what they think they know, maybe they, they're confused, or they've heard something about that, or heard something like that, and then that's when you have an opportunity to. Okay, so we're, we're listening. We can ask questions uh, to try to gauge where they're, where they're at. And we listen to what they're saying and make, we're making a judgment. It's a judgment call about how much we think they already know about Scripture. Uh, one thing that I had to learn in doing personal evangelism is that there's some people who, uh, it, this is not the time for me to try to get them to pray and receive Jesus. That was very difficult for me because at the beginning I thought, well, you know, this person could die 10 minutes from now. They need to be saved. Now, no matter what's happening, I've got to get them on their knees praying the sinner's prayer. But I had to learn that that's not necessarily true. Uh, and that one, of the, one of the circumstances that I've learned uh, over the years uh, is that when somebody is inebriated, <laughs> I don't get them to pray. Uh, and I did learn that the hard way. You know, uh, you, can, you can manipulate the degraded people into doing all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, the next day when they're straight they, and they're sober, uh, they don't always appreciate it. Uh, and so I, I had to realize, look, this person is not in state of mind where they can make a decision. And they may not even understand uh, what, what we're talking about. So, so uh, I don't believe in degraded people. To, uh, and, and to pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you can go somewhere and, and pump a full of coffee, that's something else. Yes, well, if you, if you convert someone into, say, the sinner's prayer, they didn't win. They're not saved. Their heart wasn't ready. They didn't say it anyway. And all you've done is really do the disservice because in the back of their mind, they think they are. They're yeah. just going to go about their very little way. Right, that's a very good, very good point. Uh, if, if we're if we're clumsy about this, we can actually inoculate people against the gospel. And, and I hate to say this out loud, because this, don't take that as an excuse not to tell people about Jesus. All right? Uh, take it as advice to just make sure that you do it right. It's not that hard to do it right. But we can inoculate people against the gospel. Um, if, and it happens in church. 
It happens in vacation Bible school. Let me explain to you how that happens. Little Johnny comes up when we give a gospel presentation, and he's weeping. Uh, and I won't use the adult word, I'll use the preacher. All right, we'll beat up on the preacher. So the preacher, John, why did you, John? I'm so glad you came forward. You, you, you're being convicted of your sin by the Holy Spirit, aren't you, John? And you know, don't you, Johnny, that Jesus offered himself voluntarily as an atoning sacrifice so that you can be forgiven of all your sins. Right, Johnny? And you're ready to confess Jesus as Lord. You see where I'm going with this. You know, I've met Johnny later in life when he's 22 or so. Uh, and that that didn't help John. It actually confused. And so one of the things that we do when we have vacation Bible school or invitations when we hopefully they will get back to that um, is people who do that are trained, you know. Just say, why don't you come forward and, and be quiet and let them talk. If they don't know that they've come forward and get saved, then they probably didn't. And the fact is, it's not everybody's ready to be saved. You do need to understand the gospel before you can be saved. And, uh, if you're talking to somebody, for instance, just to pull something out of thin air, if you're talking to a Muslim who knows nothing about Christianity, well, you better, why don't you make friends with them and drink coffee and talk about the Bible and, and spend some time explaining to them what the, uh, what the Bible tells us uh, about uh, the fall uh, and about uh, why Jesus came and all of that, fill in, fill in some of the spaces, uh, some of the spaces for them. So Bible knowledge is important. We want to try to gauge that as we go along. Um, all right, so the next page, let me just read this to you, starting with gospel pictures, and you can follow along. So Jesus, Nicodemus was a spiritual leader, a killer in the He was certain that his birthright as a descendant of Abraham assured him a place in God's kingdom. The idea of a favored status by virtue of birth gave Jesus what he needed for his gospel picture. The Lord pointed out that a person must be born again to enter God's kingdom, a wordplay which also allows for the meaning of born from above. When Nicodemus objected, Jesus also used a wonderful comparison with the wind to speak about the work of God's Holy Spirit. And, I didn't put it in here, but he went on to actually talk about uh, Moses and the serpent. So Jesus really, really did a lot of work with Nicodemus on a lot of different levels here. Uh, but do you see where he got his picture from? Nicodemus thought that by virtue of his birthright, he was right with God, and that's why he said he must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Your birth, that you think, uh, gives you the right to be in the kingdom won't work. And that was an insult uh, to, to Nicodemus. And that's another thing about presenting gospel. Unfortunately, if you present the gospel right and well and often, you will, at some point, insult somebody. So, just kind of ready for that. Uh, but, it's not for you to, to uh, convict somebody of their sin. That's what the, the Holy Spirit is. Yeah. So let's think about a present day example that would be something more like that. Each week I'll give you a new present day example. Things, many of them have actually been used by me or others uh, um, when we've been out talking to people uh, about Jesus. Present day example, one common daily task for many people is caring for and raising their children, sometimes grandchildren. Parents and grandparents will often make great sacrifices for their children and grandchildren, even though their sons and daughters make poor choices. This strong natural affection serves as a wonderful picture of God's great love for us. Like the son in Jesus' parable of the prodigal in Luke 15, we turn from God by disobeying his commands. Like the father in Jesus' parable, God desires reconciliation. When we turn from the ways of the world and come to him in humility, he receives us, not as a servant, but as his son or daughter. When we see signs that a person is raising children like toys in the yard or in the house, we may be able to establish a friendly dialogue about the kids. This subject may enable us to use a gospel picture that reflects the storyline in Jesus' parable about the prodigal of the son. 
For instance, imagine your son or daughter growing up and turning away from you, etc. And you develop that, that uh, picture. This picture allows us to compare the prodigal's return to his father with the act of placing saving faith in Jesus in order to be reconciled to God. Okay? So um, these are basic relationships in life. Parents, spouse, brothers and sisters. As we've been talking about on Sunday morning, they all reflect, when they're healthy, they all reflect something about our relationship to God. And so as we see that people are engaged in these relationships, we can learn to use that to describe what it means to be restored to God. In this case, uh, a child. This one uh, I used when we were in Seattle a few years ago. I was speaking to a lady out on the beach, uh, and I was surprised to find out, gauging her biblical knowledge, by the way, that she had never heard of the prodigal son. The way that it went is she began to talk about a grown child who was living in Florida and was on drugs. And I just almost offhand said to her, oh, well, I'm, I'm an ex prodigal son. Uh, and so keep up, keep faith. And it, what those words meant absolutely nothing. To her, and I could tell that immediately by the look on her face that I was speaking, uh, that I was speaking another language to her. And so I asked her, I said, so you don't know the story of the prodigal son, do you? And she said, no, what's that? Uh, and I said, well, this is actually a teaching of Jesus. It's in the Bible. And here's how it goes. Uh, and, and I just told her the story and used that to present the gospel to her. She did not get saved. I hope she did sometime after that. Uh, but it was an opportunity to use something in her life that was very, very important for her. She was, she was getting choked up when she, as she talked about her grown son who was still on, on drugs uh, and was still in the, the prodigal state. And so as I told the story, she was, she was pretty focused on what I was saying. Uh, and it's, when we present the gospel in a way that is contextualized, I use that word, contextualized for that person's life, something that they're engaged in emotionally, uh, and it, it, it has a freshness, it speaks in a way uh, that has power, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing. As we go on, next, next time we get together, we'll see that the next conversation he has, which is going to be the woman at the well, is completely different from the conversation that he had. With Nicodemus. Completely. You would think he was talking about two different subjects, but he's not. He is, he is looking at the person he's talking to. In this particular case, Nicodemus and the woman at the well almost couldn't be two more different people. And so he doesn't use his same presentation from Nicodemus to talk to the woman at the well. He completely changes his presentation. He didn't use his presentation about the living water with Nicodemus because Nicodemus needed to hear something else. So what we're talking about is you and I. Listen to this. Have the same Holy Spirit in us that Jesus had in him when he was doing this. And I have confidence that you can do the same thing that Jesus did. What did Jesus say to his disciples? You will do greater things than I do. That's pretty intimidating. But Jesus said it. All right, let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Guys, we're going to serve you. Come on up. We're going to do, come up to the table again tonight. Uh, but, good news.